Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Robert Litvak, uh, the Center's Vice President for Programs, and I'm filling in for uh, Sonia Michelle, uh, my colleague who's Director of United States Studies. Uh, she's in Amsterdam and un unable to fly out uh, due to volcanic ash. Uh, in my 27 years at the Wilson Center, where I've been a pinch hitter uh, chairing meetings, that is a unique utterance on my part. <laughs> And Sonia, it's uh, five, uh, six hours later, if you're up watching this live webcast, we send you greetings from Washington, D.C., and hope the cloud literally lifts and you get out of, uh, you're able to leave Amsterdam. It's my great pleasure to, to chair today's meeting, moderate today's meeting uh, for uh, my uh, dear former colleague, Flip Strom, uh, who uh, re remains a role model in terms of productivity. She has produced yet another marvelous book, uh, Mendez versus Westminster. Uh, school desegregation and Mexican American rights, which has been it's just been published and is available for purchase uh, and uh, autographing by the author after this session concludes. So we're here today to celebrate this pub the publication of this marvelous new book, um, and we're uh, fortunate to have with us three distinguished commentators who will initiate uh, the uh, the discussion. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with her, uh, Philippa. Flipstrom is uh, currently a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, you have full bios in front of you, uh, so I, I will not uh, repeat what you have in, in front of you. She's the former director of United States Studies uh, here at the center. Uh, her uh, opening um, presentation, where she'll provide an overview of the book uh, using PowerPoint, um, uh, she will be followed by our three commentators. Uh, Cornelia Pillard, who's a professor of law at Georgetown University, uh, Delia Pomp uh, Pampa, who's the vice president for education at the Na National Co Council of La Raza, and Thomas Sines, who's uh, the uh, president and general counsel of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. I should mention that today's meeting is co-sponsored uh, by the United States Studies Program at the Wilson Center, the Mexico Institute here, uh, in cooperation with the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund and the National Council of La Raza. So we're, par we're delighted to be partnering with these other institutions for today's book launch uh, and to uh, uh, mark and, and celebrate the publication of Philippa Strum's uh, uh, marvelous uh, new book, Mendez versus Westminster. So, Philip, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Rob. And Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I'd like to thank Sonia Michelle, wherever you are at the moment, hanging out in Amsterdam um, with friends, and Richard Iserman, the Program Associate for U.S. Studies, for arranging this program, and my wonderful intern, Jasper Colt, who not only has organized the PowerPoints for me, but in the course of doing so, has taught me how to do them myself, kind of. <laughs> so next time out, we'll see whether I can solo. We will see. I thought, um, oh, oh, and before I, I go on, I should say, and thank you so much to the three commentators. I am so delighted that you're taking the time to do this and really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I thought what I would do is uh, just tell you how I happened to come write this book, which is something of a departure for me, uh, talk a little bit about the background in which this case happened, the case itself, of course, and then kind of summarized by analyzing what it was what it was all about. So, how it happened. I'm a relative newcomer to Washington. I moved here to take this job at, at uh, the Wilson Center some years ago, and I thought, well, I have to read what everybody else around me is reading, and that means the Washington Post, and I didn't know then that most of my colleagues at the center didn't read the style section, so I was reading the style section meticulously. <laughs> And one day in 2007, I was reading the style section, and I suddenly came upon this article. It said that the U.S. Postal Service had issued a stamp about a case called Mendez versus Westminster, and that it was an important constitutional law case. And my reaction was, no, 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 no. I have been teaching constitutional law for 35 years. I never heard of this case. This is not possible. So of course, I then had to go find out what this what Mendez versus Westminster was all about. And I discovered I wasn't the only person who didn't know about it. 
it's not discussed in most of the constitutional law case books. It's not discussed in the biographies of Earl Warren, although, as you'll see, he becomes a figure in this. It's basically just not there. And the more I read about it, the more I said, something's wrong here. This is a really important moment in American history. And I decided, well, there isn't a book about Mendes versus Westminster, so I think I'll write one. And so I did. And so let me tell you now what this is all about. I'm just going to read to you from the very beginning of the book. I promise I'm not going to do a lot of reading from the book at all. Soledad Vidori walked up to the schoolhouse door, five little children in her wake. It was a warm September 1943 day in Westminster, California, home to some 2,500 residents and right in the heart of citrus growing country. American soldiers were still fighting overseas. Almost two more years of battles lay ahead before World War II would end. But Orange County was peaceful and bustling economically because of the wartime demand for agricultural products and war factory materiel. Mrs. Fedori had come to the Westminster Main School to enroll her two daughters, Alice and Virginia Fedori, and her niece and two nephews, Sylvia Mendez, Gonzalo Mendez, Jr., and Jerome Mendez in the neighborhood public school. Mrs. Vidori was welcomed to the school and was told that her daughters could be registered. Their father had a French ancestor and their last name sounded acceptably French or Belgian to the teacher in charge of admissions. Besides, the Vidori girls were light-skinned. The Mendez children, however, were visibly darker and to the teacher, their last name was all too clearly Mexican. They would have to be taken to the Mexican school a few blocks away. Little Gonzalo Jr. would remember the teacher telling his aunt, we'll take those, indicating the Vidori girls, but we won't take those three. We were too dark, Gonzalo recalled. No way, an outraged Mrs. Vidori replied and marched all the children home. Now these are the three Mendez children here with, as you see, their babysitter. This is Sylvia Mendez, who again becomes an important part of the story two years later. And this is the Vidori girls who were taken to the school that day. I assume they didn't have their hair flowing quite that way when they were taken, but I don't really know that. However, they are clearly um, lighter. All right, now for a little bit of the societal setting. Here's California, and here, as you see in the green, there's Orange County, down in the south, not far from the border. There was a huge expansion of Western railroads in the, the starting late 1920s, 1930s, 1940s in the United States, and there was also a huge expansion of irrigated agriculture in California. And the net result, that there was a great need for labor in California, with a huge rise in the value of California crops. And so Mexicans who were trying to get out of Mexico, particularly during rather the tumultuous years of the 1920s and 1930s, ended up to a great extent in California. Now, many of them ended up in the Southern California Citrus Belt, which includes Orange County, California. Um, I keep wanting to walk over. I'm really not used to this this um, laser thing yet. And there's Orange, Orange County. It's part of the Citrus Belt. And where they lived for the most part was in colonias. Now, this is just an indication of how important the Mexicans uh, became to the agricultural industry of California. As you see, by 1940, they were... 100% of ca the California agricultural population of the workers. And they did live in colonias. These are the colonias in Orange County, the neighborhoods that were on the outskirts of towns or in some cases just on the outskirts of farms. And the colonias consisted largely of wooden buildings, many of them constructed by the workers themselves. They did not have sewers in the colonias, there were no toilets, there was no refrigeration, there were no paved streets, 
the colonies were not a, a pleasant place to live. And many of the Mexican Americans quite understood that the way that out of the colonies was through education. And so schools, of course, became really, really important. However, California was not very good on the way it treated its minority populations and schools. Starting in the late 19th century, California passed laws permitting the segregation of Asian American students and Native American students specifically. But because these lo this law was passed first at the late 19th century when there were not yet very many Mexican Americans, the law omitted Mexican Americans. Remember that because that really becomes very relevant to the story. By 1930, however, Mexicans were the largest minority group in California. And the California school system reacted to this by segregating Mexican American students. Pasadena instituted the first Mexican school, Mexican in quotation mark school, in 1913. By the mid-20s, there were 15 such Mexican schools in Orange County. By 1931, more than 80% of the Mexican-American kids were in segregated schools in Orange County. Now this is a picture of the Mexican school to which the Mendez children were sent. And I don't know whether it looks to you like a perfectly decent place. Somehow California buildings always look a little bit more decent on the outside than equivalent buildings from the Northeast. But if you notice, there aren't very many windows. And around the school, there was nothing but bare land. Beyond the bare land was an electrified fence, and beyond that was a cow pasture. There was no place in the school for the kids to eat lunch. The kids were sent out to sit on the ground, and the flies from the cow pasture would land on them and their lunches. And so that was the way the kids remembered eating lunch, covered by flies. And that was not unusual for the schools, the Mexican schools. In 1928, two University of Southern California professors were hired by Santa Ana, which is one of those four colonias that I showed you, to look at the schools. And what they found was what you see there, that the schools were by and large wooden fire hazards, places that did not encourage education at all. You notice not enough electricity for the kids to be able to read. So we're, we're not talking about first-rate schools here at all. The schools also had a different curriculum from the so-called white schools. The boys were taught carpentry and gardening. The girls were taught sewing and homemaking. In other words, what the schools were doing was turning out a workforce for low-paid jobs. Now, how is this justified? And the answer is basically biological determinism. These are some of the things that a few of the California educators said during this period. And essentially what they're emphasizing is biological differences, as they saw them, between the Mexican-American kids and the so-called white kids. Lower IQs, supposedly, and in something that may sound familiar to you from other situations, a sense of rhythm, a sense of art, but not a sense of intellect. This is a quote from, as you see, the superintendent of schools of a district in Texas. This was absolutely typical of what educators were saying at the time. And these are the people who are in charge of educating the kids. These are not just people who are theorizing in some abstract way. Notice a Mexican child will reach the puberty stage earlier. You have real biological determinism here. And here is a quote from a man who was the superintendent of schools of one of the four districts that was at issue in Mendez versus Westminster. This is from his MA thesis, which became a very important work for educators during this period, indicating, as you see, that there is a great difference in intellectual ability. All right, into this situation come Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez. <laughs> 
Now, Gonzalo Mendez had been brought to this country from Mexico when he was a child of eight years old. Felicitas had been brought from Puerto Rico by her family. The Mendezes were living in Santa Ana where they ran a cafe. And during the war, in the early 1940s, as you know, Japanese Americans in California were relocated to relocation camps and moved out of California. One family, the Munamitsu family, was particularly concerned that their farm simply not be taken away from them while they were gone. Their banker was also the banker of the Mendezes. Gonzalo Mendez had long said that he wanted to run a farm. And so the banker went to Mr. Mendez and said, okay, this is your chance. What about taking over the farm of the Munamitsus? The Mendezes went to Arizona, where the Munamitsu family was interned, and agreed to lease the farm. At that point, the Mendezes moved from Santa Ana to Westminster, where the farm was located. And it was at that point that they tried to enroll their, ch their children in the Westminster School and were told, no, you can't, you can't be here. In um, 1945, which is when the case was brought, Sylvia Mendez was nine, Gonzalo Jr. was eight, Jerome was seven. So these three little, three little children. The Mendezes went repeatedly to the school officials in Westminster and then to school officials for all of Orange County and what they got was basically, no, your kids cannot go to the white school. And what they were told was what people in other uh, districts of Orange County were being told, which was, your children don't speak good English, and besides which, they're dirty. This was being told to one set of parents over and over and over again, and the Mendezes were just simply not prepared to take this. But what to do? Well, one of the drivers on the farm said, I've just recently read about a case that was brought by a lawyer named David Marcus in Los Angeles who got San Bernardino County, which is the county right next door, to let Mexican Americans into the one public part and swimming pool that existed in the county. Why don't you go see David Mendez? And so they did. David Mendez was himself the, immigrant, uh, the son of immigrant Jewish parents who had been discriminated against while he was growing up and had some sense of what discrimination was all about, who was married to a Mexican-American woman with whom he had children. And at the time that the case was brought, his kids were all in public schools. Though so David Mendez had some sense for the California public schools. And what he said to Gonzalo Mendez and Felicitas Mendez was, Let's see whether other people have been treated the same way you, because if, if you have, because if we can bring a class action suit, that would make your case all the stronger. So for a year, Gonzalo gave up running the farm, turns it over to Felicitas, who did a bang up job of running the, the farm, and he and David Mendez drove to the various colonias in Orange County asking people, have you tried to get your kids into the white schools? Have you been turned away in the same way? And of course what they found was, yes, this is exactly what happened. And so they said, all right, we are now ready to sue. Then the problem for David Marcus was, all right, where do I bring this case? I can go into state court and say, all right, look at that law that you passed that says you can segregate Native American kids and Asian American kids. It doesn't say anything about Mexican American kids. Therefore, you shouldn't be segregating them. But Marcus said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to have an all out frontal assault on segregation. I want to take this into federal court. I want a ruling that segregation is wrong. Well, there was a little problem with that. Oh, I'm sorry. I almost forgot. There's David Marcus. He's the gentleman in the middle, um, the, the guy all the way on the right is his dad and the other people are his brothers. He, here's the law that was going to be relevant for David Marcus. This is the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And of course, as you see, and as many of you already know, it talks about the equal protection of the laws. But the question is, what does equal protection mean? As with many clauses of the Constitution, that's a little bit unclear and not necessarily self-explanatory. The Supreme Court had interpreted it. The Supreme Court had said in Plessy versus Ferguson that 
equal protection of the laws is honored when you have separate but equal institutions. And while Plessy versus Ferguson was a transportation case, the court specifically made the analogy to schools in that case. And so the court was saying at the time that the Mendezes wanted to bring their case separate but equal is fine. All right, so this is a little bit of a problem for David Marcus. What, is, what does he do about this? And bad enough that he knew that the court had said Plessy versus Ferguson was okay, Thurgood Marshall, who was then a lawyer for the NAACP, had specifically decided not to tackle segregation head-on because he quite understood that the Supreme Court was not ready to backtrack from Plessy versus Ferguson. So here you have the NAACP, Thurgood Marshall, head of the biggest civil rights organization in the country, saying we can't attack segregation head-on. All right, so what does David Marcus do, even though he wants to do it? And of course, the NAACP was always thinking that eventually we would attack segregation head on, but they were simply working up to it and uh, using a different kind of tactic. All right, so what does David Marcus do? David Marcus says, this case is not about racial segregation at all. We're not attacking racial segregation. What we're saying is Mexicans are white. So this case is not about separation of the races. This is about segregating people because of their Mexican or Latin descent. So you don't have interracial segregation here. You have intraracial segregation here. And there's no good reason for it. What Marcus would argue is, by definition, you're giving the Mexican-American kids a poorer education because by separating them out, you're interfering with their development of language, English language, which is one of the goals of the school system. And you're interfering with their integration into the larger society, which is another goal of the school system. Therefore, you're giving them an inferior ed education. So segregation, by definition, according to Marcus, results in an inferior education. Well, the case goes to court. Signed to the case is Judge Paul McCormick, who was an Irish Catholic, very prominent in Los Angeles society. He had been appointed to the federal bench by Calvin Coolidge back in 1924, and he was inclined to think that education was very much a state matter, and he didn't really know that a case attacking anything about education belonged in federal court, but he was willing to listen. Opposing David Marcus was George Holden, who was the assistant county counsel for Orange County, who would argue, as the case was being heard, that the reason the school district was segregating the, the kids was because of language. They simply came in not speaking English. This necessarily impacted their ability to learn for their own good and for the good of the other children they had to be separated. But notice the words that I've italicized. He didn't. It's not only their language, they've got Spanish customs. In other words, implicit here is this idea that you're different, you're inferior because you come from a Spanish-speaking background, and it's not just the language itself. There's certainly, again, some biological determinism here. All right, so David Marcus goes into court, and what, what he argues is the kids were not given any language tests before they were assigned to the Mexican school, so how can you possibly say this is for their own good? He brings in some of the older children, some of the teenagers, to testify just to show that, they, yes, they have perfectly good English language skills. He brings in people like Gonzalo Mendez and um, others of the parents who tried to get their kids into the white schools. One of the parents is, even though she has the same first name, it's not, it's not Mrs. Mendez, Felicitas Fuentes, who tried to get a, one of her younger sons into the white school, but whose older son, Joe, was fighting in the Philippines at the time that she went to try to do this. And of course, as you see, she says, okay, if all these kids are so dirty that you can't let them in, then bring my son home from the Philippines, and you know, he's, then he's too dirty to fight with all of your troops. Marcus brings in Felicitas Mendez, 
And I know you can read yourselves, and I really hate it when people put up PowerPoint and then they read what's on the screen, but I just love read, reading the first part of this. We always tell our children they are Americans. That's really what this case was about. It was about Americans standing up for their rights, and that's what Felicitas told the court. Mendes also brought in two experts, and both of the experts would testify that segregation necessarily implied inferiority, and that interfered with the ability of children to learn. This, of course, was the same argument that ultimately would be used in Brown versus Education, the Board of Education some years later. Here's a quote from the second of the experts. And so what they were saying simply is not only is there an implication of inferiority, not only does that interfere with the ability to learn but you are zapping exactly what you're supposedly wanting to teach these kids. You're not integrating them into the American society. And Judge McCormick agrees. Judge McCormick does something that is really amazing. Now the year is 1945. Segregation is still endemic in the United States. You still have the NAACP not taking segregation on full frontal you still have Plessy versus Ferguson as the law of the land. And Judge McCormick says, a paramount requisite in the American system of public education is social equality. In other words, you can by definition not have equal education if you have segregation. This is the first time a federal court ever says separate but equal is not equal. And this is before Brown versus Board of Education. And that's why I got really disturbed when I realized that we didn't know about Mendes versus Westminster. Um, we all know about Brown versus um, Board, however. And Judge McCormick goes on to say specifically that segregation does um, imply inferiority. I mean, he could have been in the mind here of what would be uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren saying, you know, this, this folks, is really what it's all about. All right, so an absolutely amazing decision. Well, what's the reaction? Law reviews all over the country suddenly say, hey, maybe it's time to end segregation in schools. This becomes a really new idea. And they say specifically, we're thinking this way because of Mendez versus Westminster. And in New York, you have Robert Carter. Now, Robert Carter was the second in command of the NAACP. And at the time of Mendes versus Westminster, Thurgood Marshall, the head of the NAA, had been ill. He was recuperating in the West Indies. So Robert Carter was running the show. And Robert Carter had long argued within the NAA that he wanted to attack segregated schools bringing in educational experts saying that separate but equal in education cannot be e equal. Other NAA lawyers were a little bit more skeptical. But Robert Carter, finding out about the decision in Mendez, says, in effect, this is my moment. I'm going to go for it. So Robert Carter then brings the NAACP into the case as it is appealed to the Court of Appeals sitting in San Francisco. But he's not the only one who comes in. So does the American Jewish Congress. So does the Japanese American Citizens League. So now all of us, and so does the National ACLU. So all of a sudden you've got this rainbow coalition saying that separate but equal is not equal. And also coming into the case is not Earl Warren himself. Earl Warren is then governor of California, but his attorney general, Robert Kenney, and clearly the Attorney General doesn't come into a case like this without the Governor of, of California um, at least knowing about it, if not specifically saying it's okay. The Court of Appeals says to the Mendezes, all right, you're right, you have a right not to be segregated, but on the basis of California law. Court of Appeals isn't as brave as Judge McCormick. The Court of Appeals says, all right, that law didn't mention Mexican-Americans, so you can't segregate Mexican-Americans. But at that point, the state legislature, knowing about Mendez versus Westminster, says, 
hey, maybe it's time to undo this law. And lo and behold, the state legislature and Governor Earl Warren get rid of the law allowing segregation in education in California. The result in Mexican-American communities throughout the Southwest is phenomenal. There's organization all over the Southwest. There's one school district after another being integrated as a result of Mendez. And of course, much later on, as you know, Brown versus Board of Education. Okay, so why did this work? At this particular moment, after all of these years of segregation, why does this work? And I postulate that, first of all, the people who brought the case, in many cases, were Americans who had been born in the United States and who had grown up with American values and who understood exactly what it was they were entitled to. They were also veterans of World War II. Over 350,000 Mexican Americans fought in World War II. And they came home and said, hmm, we're fighting for justice overseas, but we're, our kids can't get justice in the United States. What is going on here? And they started to organize. The educational elite began to rethink some of its theories, and I suspect equally important, the Truman administration, as the Roosevelt administration before it, was very concerned about international relations and the image of the United States as one that was going to be a land of racial equality rather than racial inequality. So, Mendes versus Westminster, then ultimately Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, and as we get closer to today, finally, Mendes versus Westminster starts to be noticed. This, these are just a few of, of the uh, quotes that I had stuck up of, um, in one case, the World War II veterans coming back and saying, okay, we have a right to have our kids um, get justice here. And the teenager who's saying essentially the same thing, indicating that this is a cross-generational phenomenon. The year 2000, Santa Ana, California, one of the segregating school districts opens the Gonzalo and Felicita Mendez School. And, of course, in 2007, the Postal Service issues this stamp. I want just to read you this very last paragraph in conclusion. Gonzalo Mendez died far too young. Gonzalo Mendez died in, in 1964 when he was only 51 years old, but Felicitas Mendez was alive for quite some time after that. In 1998, when Felicitas Mendez was terminally ill, she spoke with her daughter Sylvia about her regret that Gonzalo had died before the Mendez case became better known. Sylvia dedicated herself to educating the public about it. Mendez was an important moment in Mexican-American history, she would tell audiences, but it was equally significant as a moment when Mexican-Americans, African-Americans, Japanese-Americans, and Jewish-Americans cooperated to undo what they saw as a great injustice. Mendez is about everybody coming together, she commented in 2009. And in Mendez, during those optimistic post-war years, when it appeared that justice was close at hand and all things were possible, they did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flip. Uh, we'll turn now to our commentators. Uh, first, uh, Professor uh, uh, Cornelia uh, Pillard. Hi. Um, this this book was such a pleasure for me to read, and it was really full of revelations for me. I'm a professor, but I was also a um, lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund earlier in my career, and I litigated cases of racial discrimination, and I have to say that reading this detailed account of this case um, was very familiar uh, to me. Um, I wanted to touch on, on two themes, and. Uh, really focus on on the second but first first I want to say that I think um, that the unearthing and the detailed discussion of Mendez um, in in the historical context is the major contribution of this book um, it, it, Strum has not just reported on a case but as in her earlier work such as her wonderful book on 
on VMI, she's really quickly and effectively described the surrounding circumstances, and you get a little bit of a flavor, but I would say just a little bit of it in her remarks um, today. And one of her theses really grows out of that. She mentions it in you know, straight up, uh, maybe a couple of times in the book, but it really just emanates from the book. Um, and one of the times that she articulates it is um, that she says there was, qu there is, quote, an ongoing relationship between law and society. Societal attitudes would have to change before a judge would write that segregation with its implication of inf inferiority was unjust, or law reviews would publish articles calling for the overturning of Plessy versus Ferguson. Law, in turn, affects societal dynamics. Mendez clearly heartened the Mexican-American community and its activists, encouraging the spate of litigation and pressure on school boards that gradually ended segregation policies in many districts. So that's kind of you know a thesis stated straight up. And then uh, the book so beautifully goes through a number of sort of strands of that context, including the political and economic forces, which she touched on just briefly in her remarks today, what was going on politically and economically in Mexico, what was going on with the migration of Mexicans to the United States, um, uh, Hoover uh, creating a big deportation in the 30s, through which a lot of the Mexican-American population had learned to resist and to fight back. It was politicizing. Um, there were quotas on immigra immigrants from Europe that which were not applied to immigrants from Mexico and Central and, and South America. So there was, again, a great surge of um, immigration coming from Mexico. And uh, as she mentioned, the wartime agricultural demands uh, created a lot of jobs uh, for Mexicans in um, in Southern California, um, and the the uh, so so there's a sort of a political and economic dynamic that she puts in in context very quickly. She talks about the roots of the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement, the development of a civil rights coalition went with the NAACP, writing amicus briefs, um, and. Uh, the Mendez family relying on some of the sort of nascent political organizations that, that did exist, including LULAC and others um, at the time. Um, she also talks on this I found really fascinating, and it's, it's, it's a familiar theme, but it's very prominent here, the international context, um, the way that the, we're here on the, on the um, tail end of World War II, and it made Americans, including Federal District Court Judge Paul McCormick, very conscious of that, that Mexican-American citizens had served honorably in the war and really deserved to be treated uh, as full citizens at home. Um, and uh, so, so those are just, just some of the flavor of the context. So I think that, you know, that's a major contribution of the book is the way that the context is so richly drawn and it gives us a real tool to understanding our civil rights history. And the other theme that I just wanted to touch on is the way that um, sort of this story is revealing about litigation in particular as a civil rights strategy. What is the fact that this was a battle fought in court and the victory enshrined in a court decision mean for the nature of the uh, effort itself and the, and the legacy that it leaves. And one thing that struck me was um, yes, there are some of the strengths of the law on display here. The law uh, requires a certain rigor in proof of facts. Um, it has requirements also of legally valid justifications for government action, as here the, the different treatment of Mexican Americans. And these tools are just very well suited to helping to crystallize and flush out this problem. If you contrast it with just general political discussion, you don't have those proof requirements. You don't have the specificity of certain plaintiffs, like the Mendez family, putting themselves forward as entitled to and demanding relief. So in political discussion, I would argue stereotypes are sort of understood, well, sometimes they're true, maybe they're not always true, but sometimes they are true, and they often end up carrying the day in a way that the focus of litigation does not uh, permit. In court, the standards are more demanding. So you see the kind of formalism as well as the individualism of the litigation focus having a really important traction here. And, and in particular, the book is very rich with these quite horrific descriptions 
of the various rationales put forward by the various school officials for excluding these students. And the, pr the predominant one, uh, as Professor Strom has said, was language. You know, these were Spanish-speaking students, um, but they also included alienage, lack of personal hygiene, uh, loose morals, an agricultural schedule where the students had to arrive at school maybe sometimes a month later than the Anglo students, lack of American culture at home, and on and on. So they have all these rationales that are kind of bubbling around, and when you come into court, you know, Judge McCormick and, and uh, Attorney Marcus required that they actually answer the questions going to these, did you ever test any students for language facility? Well, no, we never did. How did you determine who had to go to the Mexican American school? Well, based on their last name. You know, well, what if somebody was, you know, 90 percent Mexican lineage and their last name was O'Shaughnessy? You know, would they go? Well, yes, they would go. And so there's this kind of constant shifting um, of rationales. You know, they, they are, many of them, and the Mendezes were citizens, so this idea that they're not American uh, is shot down under the, the formal lens of, of the court, looking at these, these children in particular. The, some of the context that Professor Strom provides in the book includes when the um, housing is first set up by uh, the growers, I guess, for the Mexican workers, um, they don't provide any plumbing. And so these communities that then you know, become quite stable and, and uh, are the Mexican-American Mexican neighborhoods over time don't actually have plumbing. And so the kids are arriving at school, in fact, some of them dirty. <laughs> and there's this, so there's both the stereotype, ah, they're all dirty, but there's also the reality of the poverty of these, these students and the conditions that were indeed created by the terms on which they're invited to come and work uh, for, um, for the Anglos and provide agricultural produce uh, for the American economy. Um, so, there's this, so there's this proof requirement and the focusing of the lens on the plaintiffs. The other thing that happens in litigation that I thought was, was really on display here and very, very interesting was the way that litigation allows a, a control and narrowing of the terms of the debate. And in this case, it's somewhat artificial. Um, the dis and, and in two ways I would highlight. One was that there was a decision here in this case to frame it as not a race case, as Professor Strum has mentioned. This is not about race. In order to finesse the Plessy versus Ferguson obstacle, because this is a federal district court, and you're not going to get a decision from the federal district court overturning or going against Plessy. This was, I thought, really interesting, quite brilliant, and also sort of weird. Um, the brilliance obviously comes from the way in which what is going on uh, sounds an awful like, a lot like race discrimination. To me, uh, it's even described in, ter in racial terms by some of the school officials who are perpetrating it. And yet, using this strategy, David Marcus manages to sidestep Plessy and critically undermine it from below by generating this precedent that kind of everybody knows is intention with Plessy. I mean, that's where the sort of it is or it isn't about race comes in because the, the very fact that this decision has the strength then to go and undermine Plessy is because there's a sense that there's at least a family resemblance here uh, between the kind of racism that the United States is, is exerting against African Americans and the kind of racism that it's exerting against uh, these Mexican Americans. Um, and it's very hard not to describe what happened in these school districts as sort of the racialization of Mexican Americans looking at the skin color. I mean, think of the event that triggers the case in the first place, the Mendez children versus the Vidari children. And part of it is just the teacher who's making the admissions decisions looking at them and making a decision. Partly it's the names, but partly she's just doing, uh, you know, and both of those are kind of these, these insignia of racialization. Um, and, you know, and the harm here was the harm of stigmatizing, uh, overgeneralization, sustaining subordination, based on um, what are perceived to be immutable characteristics. Um, so it's, it's not race. In the artificial and controlled dialogue of the court, um, even though in so many ways, politically, it is. Um, and it, the, the second way that I wanted to point out that 
uh, the debate was artificially narrowed uh, and the narrow focus sustained by the court decision was that the plaintiffs did not argue that the schools were unequal. Um, and the decision was made in order to allow an attack on the separation itself as, as problematic. Um, and this was the major way, another major way in which this case presages Brown. Um, that focus is narrow. That focus is really counterfactual. I mean, Strum's book explains that uh, these schools were not in any way equal. They were uh, often no more than sheds, you know, built on an asphalt floor uh, without ventilation, without proper windows, without proper light. They taught vocational subjects. They, you know, treated the students as people who were uh, destined for a subordinate position in society, and they were being trained for that uh, position. So it was, it was indeed the very difference, uh, as well as the separation of the students that were an insult uh, to the families that, that brought the litigation. Um, and, you know, that is also part of what's problematic, not only about Mendez, but also, as we all know, about Brown, is the way that once separate but equal is legally struck down, um, the implicit message is these facilities are now equal. Um, and for at least some observers, it follows that there's no more reason to be concerned about uh, inequality. There's no more reason to worry that we've created an identifiable underclass. And as Professor Strom comments at the end of her book, we do indeed today in the United States see uh, schools that are de facto quite racially segregated. We see a concentration of um, poorer students, often identifiably minority students, in urban school districts. And part of the difficult legacy of Mendez and Brown is to find a way to see these cases as one step along a road and not as a solution uh, to these problems that are still with us. And I just, I just wanted to close with one um, additional aspect of sort of what's interesting to me about the fact that this is a court case and what the, what the court-based um, context of it uh, produces. You have this kind of formalism of the way the proof is, is dealt with and the way the rationalizations are shot down. Um, but you end up from Judge McCormick with a really uh, very substantive vision of what, uh, what the Constitution provides for these students. And it's one of the quotes that, that Professor Strom had put up on the board. Um, he talks about um, the importance of integration, commingling of the entire student body, instills and develops a common cultural attitude among the school children, which is imperative for the perpetuation of American institutions and ideals. It is also established by the record that the methods of segregation prevalent in the defendant school districts foster antagonisms in the children and suggest inferiority among them where none exists. Um, so he's got a substantive vision of people coming together and recognizing one another's humanity. It's also, as you see, quite a nationalistic vision, which is interesting given that this is a population of children of, of immigrants, that the, this, the very um, nationalistic thinking uh, becomes the tool for bringing them, um, bringing them together. And we can all critique that particular vision, but what I found to be powerful was the way that the, that the legal um, frame for this piece of progress on civil rights had both this kind of very formalist set of tools, but also produced a substantive vision. And um, we aren't getting much large substantive vision on civil rights from the courts today. And so I would really look to the next two commentators who I think can tell us much more. Um, I mean, I don't know what they're going to tell us, but I'm, but I'm hoping they'll tell us more about um, how we can conceptualize this case and, and the Brown case as steps along a road rather than as a solution and where we go from here. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn now to
Uh, Delia Pompa. Thank you. I'm the only non-lawyer in this group, and I reacted. Very good. I reacted in a very non-lawyer way when I read the book. I actually reacted on three different levels, a, a personal level, a kind of literary level, and then a policy level, because that's what I do and what I spend my time doing. Um, on the personal level, I think you've all seen the cliché reviews, I laughed, I cried. Well, in reading this book, I laughed, I cried. I, I, I laughed when I remembered um, and, and re related to very well um, one of the incidents, well, it's not an incident, the discussion about whether Mexican-Americans were white or not. And I remembered an argument my mother and father had in 1960, filling out the census as to whether they were going to check white or not in the box. Um, the sadder part is my remembering uh, that my father, for far too long in Junction, Texas, held the record of being the only Mexican-American child that didn't have to go through two years of junior first grade before he went into school. Um, and I remember going to an all-Mexican school because of de facto seg segregation and arriving finally at an integrated school in high school and figuring out that all those kids knew a lot more than I did because they'd received a lot better instruction than I had. So personally, I, I really, this book did um, touch me on a lot of emotional levels. Just from a literary standpoint, this book really is a wonderful read. I have to say, going into it, I thought, oh, a book about Mendez versus Westminster. How fun for me to read. <laughs> it was a very, very interesting book because it really is about the people and the way Philippa, if I call you Philippa, um, actually um, weaves the legal story by talking about the personalities and the people is really makes the story come home to, I think, to a lot of people. It really is a book about people living their lives and coming upon a barrier and figuring out what they have to do about it. It really is about parents trying to be good parents and finding a way that's a better way for their children. And it's about people working very hard and then figuring out that they weren't getting the rewards that they were working for. Um, and it's about people who have a very, very deep understanding of why they came to this country and why they would take on such a task of changing the law and getting what was rightfully theirs. Uh, the other human level in the book really does tell the story of how many uh, minority communities came together to win this case. And I think that's a, a piece of the history of this that can't be overlooked. I, I laugh again because this book, uh, and even in the title, it talks about Mexican-American rights. And we always forget that the mother was Puerto Rican. So this, this really is not just about Mexican-American rights and wasn't at the time. It really was about rights of Hispanic people. Um, What's interesting to me, just also from a literary level, is that the legal story really, really is woven throughout this personal story, and it allows you to reflect as you go along the way on the different steps in the legal system, which I think you pointed out. Now, the piece, the level upon which I, I reacted most strongly is the policy level. Being a person who works in policy day in and day out, um, I, I really marvel at some points when I, when I read the book how far we've come in 64 years, and it is 64 years. But then I look at how many of the policies and the practices that we have in place today are no different than the circumstances that caused this, this case to come before the courts. We are entering a period uh, right now of the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act which uh, those of you who aren't educators was the act that was passed during the Johnson administration that provides m all the federal aid, most of the federal aid in education and, and sets, out, um, the, um, sets out what the education program shall look like as far as the federal government can dictate and also sets up compensatory programs for children who are poor um, and in, in some cases children who speak another language. So we're entering right now a period when we're about to reauthorize the law, and as I look at what we're going to be arguing about and what we're preparing for, those same issues go back to the very issues we talked about in, in Westminster. Uh, the fact that there were achievement gaps at the time that both sides talked about, the parents talked about them and the superintendents talked about it from a different perspective clearly, but they both talked about these achievement gaps. 
we are still trying to close the achievement gap between white students, black students, and Hispanic students. And the gaps continue to grow, and they have never, ever closed. And so it's fascinating to me that 64 years later, and after the success of this case, we're still talking about those gaps, and we haven't figured out or we haven't had the political will to close them. Another piece that struck home, because I started my career in bilingual education, is the discussion about whether these kids had had language tests or not. We still talk about that. And believe it or not, there are still schools that place children in programs uh, for, for children who don't speak English based on their surname. And people are still handling cases, and lawyers are still talking to clients about that. We also are at a point in time, and as I look at the reauthorization, one of the big issues that my colleagues in the room who are going to be working with me on, uh, on um, ESCA reauthorization know is the whole testing issue and how uh, limited English proficient children will be tested. We still don't today, 64 years later, have valid assessments for these kids. We still don't know how to include these assessments and their results in the overall accountability system we're still dealing with the same issue. Uh, language education in and of itself, I remember one, one piece in the book where the judge asks um, the superintendent if the children are being taught by teachers who speak their language and the superintendent sort of says, of course not, like what a silly thing. That still happens in the United States today. Children come into our schools not speaking English and don't have anyone that understands what they're saying, and for a long time they don't understand what's going on in the classroom. Still focusing on, on teachers, one of the things one of the superintendents says, the, the person on the wrong side in this case, says is that, well, the kids have to go to these schools because the only people who are trained to work with them are the teachers in those schools. And then when he's asked, well, what kind of training did they get to work with these kids? Well, they work at that school. So today, in reauthorization, we're looking still at the notion of what an effective teacher is and whether teachers are prepared to work with the diversity of children in our schools. And we have much evidence that that isn't the case today. So that continues to be an issue. Adequacy of funding, I, I could go down the list. We still have adequ adequacy of uh, funding cases that my colleague here can talk to you about. Um, uh, that was a big argument. We don't have the money. We still talk about that today, and we still haven't solved that. Um, I could go down the list, and, and I want to be brief because I want to give my colleague an opportunity to talk, and I want you all to have an opportunity to talk some. But who would think that 64 years later that we, we still wouldn't have relief from a case that was successful? We still don't have relief. And who would think that we would still have in, institutional discrimination going on in our schools? And we do. And who would think that separate but equal continues to exist based on de facto seg segregation across our schools? All of these things are true. So in closing, I would urge us to think about the fact that it's been 64 years and that it takes us another, if it takes us another 64 years to get to where we need to be, we're all in a lot of trouble. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Sines. Thank you. Uh, I guess I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to Dr. Strum for writing this book, getting it published, and bringing attention to a case that for Latino lawyers has been a critical concern for a long, long time. Um, and I want to give a little more fabric to that gratitude uh, by telling a little bit about how I became familiar with the case. This is a case that for the Latino legal community is one that we've often had on our minds. I actually started writing about Mendez 25 years ago as an undergraduate in a Mexican-American history class uh, interested in going to law school. This is what I decided to write about. Um, and I was so fascinated by the case that I then made it a part of my senior thesis two years later, made my first trip to the National Archives in Laguna Niguel that I know Dr. Strum visited as well to look at the papers related to Mendez, and then was still fascinated with it so much that I wrote about it in law school. So the personal element of the gratitude is thank you, Dr. Strum, for taking some of the guilt off of my shoulders <laughs> of not having published the work that I put together about Mendez and bringing attention to the case. 
um, because I think it's critically important to bring attention to this case for the reasons that, that I'll talk about. But I also want to talk about some other um, reasons that I'm grateful to you. Um, I love your story um, about how the case came to your attention for two reasons. Uh, you know, as the leader of a civil rights organization, you have to make choices about what are critical issues. And I have to say that, well, it always bothered me, um, the fact that the Latino community, now the largest minority community in the country, is so woefully underrepresented in our postage stamps. I never really viewed it as a priority, but it does seem to me that your story gives an impression about why that is so important, like so much of what happens that you don't necessarily uh, understand the full impact of. But the other reason I love your story is that as a civil rights lawyer, I've often told younger lawyers, you never know where you're going to find the next big civil rights case, and you have to read the entire newspaper, not just the front page, not just the metropolitan section. You've got to read everything, including the culture section. And I had my own personal example, but now I have another example for why you re need to read the entire newspaper to find what might be the next significant civil rights case. So thank you for that as well. But my biggest uh, expression of gratitude has to do with bringing attention to this case at this time, because I think it's critically important. Uh, but before I ease into what its contemporary significance is in my mind, I want to talk a little bit more about the historical significance uh, of the Mendez case. I think that Dr. Strum is very, very good in this book at calling attention to this case as one brick on the road toward Brown versus Board of Education, and one that's often neglected. And I appreciate that for this reason. When the 50th anniversary uh, of Brown versus Board of Education was commemorated six years ago, I had occasion to be invited to a couple of law school campuses to talk about that as a Latino civil rights lawyer. Now, of course, I would end up talking about Mendez. Um, and at, on every one of those occasions, a group of Latino students would come up to me and thank me for bringing attention to Mendez because as much as Brown was being discussed in its 50th anniversary, none of their professors, uh, nobody in the administration, nobody would talk about the importance of this case. Um, and I think you're bringing to uh, greater light, uh, bringing more attention to the critical significance of this case in the development of educational desegregation through the court system is really critically important um, on an ongoing basis particularly as Delia has uh, delineated the so, so many of the ways that what we saw back then is still occurring today in the educational context. But I think it's also important to recognize that Mendez is important in a, in a related but slightly different context, which is the development of civil rights laws for the Latino community writ large. Education is only one aspect of the civil rights struggle of the Latino community in the court system. And this is where I think that you're bringing to further light, further attention, uh, the issue of race as it arose and developed in the Mendez case is so critical. Uh, in the book, Dr. Strum, uh, in, in the last chapter, talks about some of the developments post-Mendez. Uh, she mentions a case called Hernandez versus Texas, a case that also was decided in 1954, coincidentally like Brown by a unanimous Supreme Court. Coincidentally, it appears right next to Brown in the official United States reports. But Hernandez versus Texas is the first uh, major Latino civil rights case decided by the United States Supreme Court. But what is interesting about Hernandez, because it sets so much of the future of Latino civil rights work, is it for different reasons. That case was presented in the context of intra-racial discrimination. And Hernandez versus Texas is a case that involved jury exclusion. But the reason that it was presented in the context of intra-racial discrimination is because of a more or less conscious decision by Texas prosecutors in reaction to a 1930s decision by the United States Supreme Court, Norris versus Alabama, which established the exclusion rule when it came to juries and, their be and the exclusion of African Americans in the South. And that rule basically said if there's a longstanding pattern of exclusion of African Americans from juries, that's a prima facie case of a violation of the 14th Amendment. And up to that point, if you read the cases in Texas involving jury exclusion with, in relation to the Mexican-American community, it's always discussed as interracial discrimination, the exclusion of the Mexican race, of the Mexican race from juries. As soon as Norris versus Alabama comes down, you start seeing a change in language. And it starts to parallel the way things are discussed in the Mendez context in California. Now, all of a sudden, it's intra-racial discrimination. The entire reason 
was so that Texas prosecutors could go and argue that the Norris versus Alabama precedent didn't apply because Norris versus Alabama was about excluding those of the same race as the defendant from a jury. And so Texas prosecutors, I kid you not, argued repeatedly that it couldn't apply here because after all, the defendant is Mexican, Mexicans are white, all of the jurors are white. So how can that defendant possibly use the Norris versus Alabama precedent? So in a twisted way, it became intraracial discrimination, and that's the case that eventually came to the United States Supreme Court in Hernandez versus Texas. And as a result, Hernandez is a critical uh, decision because it says regardless of whether it's intraracial or interracial, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment still applies. You still cannot engage in discrimination even if you cleverly, as Texas prosecutors did, claim that it's intraracial. But that has had ramifications throughout the civil rights history of the Latino community. So let me step back. Uh, after President Obama was elected, I had occasion to be invited to discuss the question that many pundits were discussing at the time, which is, are we now in a post-racial America because we have elected an African-American president? And on more than one occasion, my answer, and I was not being flipped, was to say, as a Latino civil rights lawyer, I can tell you that we lived in a post-racial legal context for the last 50 plus years. Because Hernandez versus Texas came to the Supreme Court saying that this was a white group and this is intra-racial, so we've been post-racial for a long time. And I assured everyone, it's not so wonderful <laughs> to be post-racial because the discrimination still occurs on a regular basis, but it's not racial discrimination, so you kind of have to twist and turn to make sure that the precedents, just like with Hernandez versus Texas, and the application of Norris versus Alabama, that the precedents can still apply to the case that you're talking about. Which is why so much of the fabric of Dr. Strum's book is valuable, because it points out the ways that in a post-racial, quote, or intra-racial discrimination context, you see more or less clumsy proxies for race. So in the case of Mendez, those proxies were language, without doing any testing, as you've already heard, or any real assessment of anybody's language ability. Uh, hygiene, again, without doing any real testing or allowing any uh, exceptions where there were not quote-unquote hygiene issues. Or culture, uh, it is very much does, as Dr. Strum said, it reads like cultural or racial determinism, so much of what was being said at the time. Uh, but these proxies continue to be used, and that is in part the great contemporary significance of Mendez and the significant contribution that the appearance of this book at this time has. Because I think more and more we need to be reminded that there are proxies for racial discrimination or things that look very, very much like racial discrimination, whatever you want to categorize it as. And we need to be aware of that and we need to be certain that we adopt and pursue a legal regime that recognizes those kinds of irrational discrimination as being equally unlawful. Let me give you the very specific contemporary significance and why I hope that every reporter in particular will read this book. And that is, the state of Arizona is about to embark on a very nasty experiment through the enactment of a, a bill called SB 1070. Now, you will hear lots of reporters who are going to analogize this law to what happened 16 years ago in California when California enacted Proposition 187, which was a soup to nuts attempt to prevent undocumented immigrants from having access to any sort of government service whatsoever. Now, that was struck down by a very courageous and smart and wise United States District Court judge in Los Angeles, perhaps uh, it could be seen then as one of the inheritors of Judge McCormick's legacy, um, Mariana Felser. So you will hear a lot of reporters that analogize what Arizona is doing to Proposition 187. But what I want is for at least one report to draw the appropriate analogy going back further to what happened in Mendez. Because what SB 1070 will unleash in Arizona is discrimination on the basis of proxy to an extent that we haven't seen in quite, quite some time. There will be inadequate verification 
police officers will be directed, not invited, but directed by this bill to draw suspicions about whether someone is undocumented, and we can all figure out what the proxies will be that will go into a calculation of who is suspected of being undocumented. There are a lot of the proxies that we've seen for 60 plus years. They will be in directed to use those proxies to determine who they have to further investigate and potentially arrest for being unlawfully present in the United States. And so I hope, and, and my view is that this is just one example of the kinds of discrimination by proxy that we've seen for years and years, and that is so much a central motif of Latino civil rights development in this country. But it is my hope that this book makes a real contribution to how we talk about and hopefully how courageous United States district court judges choose to decide litigation that will come before them about Senate Bill 1070. I think its appearance at this time is propitious and needed and so much welcomed because of the context that we're in and the danger of going back to a time uh, when discrimination by proxy uh, was far more prevalent than it is today, but becomes far more prevalent, again, uh, because of its, uh, because of race's relationship uh, to supposedly relevant other characteristics. In Mendes, it was language. In Arizona, it will be around immigration status or suspected immigration status, but it will be a level of discrimination that we haven't seen in quite some time. So I think its appearance at, at this point in time is critical not just to bring attention to and reclaim the historical legacy of this case in the context of both educational desegregation and civil rights law, but I think it has a contemporary application that I hope is picked up and used as often as possible. Uh, so again, thank you at so many different levels, the personal for taking away my guilt, um, <laughs> but the much more broadly critical uh, in terms of its contemporary application and significance, Dr. Strom. Thank you. Thank you to our commenters. Let's open it. We'll open it now for uh, comments and questions on the floor. If speakers could please identify themselves. Uh, first question, Don Wolfensberger. Thank you. I'm Don Wolfensberger with the uh, Congress Project here. Uh, thank you, Flip, for your excellent uh, presentation and for the book and commentators for further highlighting the importance of the case and the book. Flip, for those of us uh, who are in the room who are both authors and non-authors, I think it would be of interest to find out what problems you encountered in writing this book, particularly we all, if we write a book, we set out to do a certain thing, we have an idea where we're going to go to get it done, but then we end up on certain side streets and up blind alleys and so on. But I was just wondering whether you'd maybe walk us through a little bit of that. Well, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, actually, it turned out to be a bit of a challenge. And so I'm really impressed to hear that you were there long before I and that you managed to pull it off. Um, and it was a challenge for a lot of reasons. One is the lack of documentation. Um, what I wanted most of all was not only the trial transcript, which I was able to get from the National Archives, but I wanted the papers of David Marcus, the lawyer in the case, so I could see what his thinking was and what was why he decided to take the case, how he de determined his strategy, things of that kind. Two of his daughters destroyed all of his papers right after he died. So that was pretty distressing, and I thought, okay, so now how do I manage to pull any of this together again? And I was really very fortunate to be able to make contact with his family. Um, with his grandchildren particularly, and as well as um, with the sons of um, Mr. Holden, who was the lawyer on the other side, and as well, very super importantly, um, with the Mendez family itself, and that, that helped fill um, some of the gaps. But what really made uh, the thing difficult for me was the amount of incorrect scholarship that's out there um, that I had to shove away before I was able to write the book. For example, I read all of the trial transcript, as you can imagine, very carefully, and took copious notes about every witness and so on and so forth. And then I was reading one of the leading scholars of Latino history who talked about the testimony of Sylvia Mendez, that young Mendez daughter, and how 
frightened she was at having to testify in court, but she went through and managed to do it anyway. And I looked at my notes, and there was nothing in there about Sylvia Mendez. And I thought, whoops. And so I looked at the page numbers of the child transcript, and then, no, there weren't any pages missing. And I thought, okay, you did a really good job here, Storm. You went through the whole thing, and you missed one witness's testimony. So I went back over the whole 500 pages of the child transcript, and there was no Sylvia Mendez there. And I looked at the other scholars who had written about the case, and they all talk about Sylvia Mendez testifying, and there's no Sylvia Mendez there. Well, finally, when I went to interview Sylvia Mendez, what we worked out was that probably she had been prepped by the lawyer, probably she had been deposed, probably her testimony had been taken by David Marcus, but he decided not to put her on the stand. Her parents took her to the trial every day, and so she was a kid of nine years old, and so it was perfectly natural that she conflated those two experiences, and she thought she testified. And when I spoke with her, we agreed that no, actually, she hadn't testified at all. Um, other scholars talked about the importance of Thurgood Marshall to the case. So I thought, okay, this is really exciting. Thurgood Marshall is in this case, one of my heroes, and he's there. Well, he wasn't. And I had to go through the NAACP papers before I found out who was there. And that, yes, of course, Thurgood Marshall's name is on the brief. He's the head of NAACP. His name is going to go on the brief. But in fact, he wasn't there. Or I uh, read all about the way the case for the county was handled by a guy named Joel Ogle, who was the county counsel of Orange County. And in fact, he turned the whole case over to jo George Holden. And he essentially wasn't there. So I learned a really good lesson, or rather I would say reinforce the lesson that I've always tried to impress on my students. You go to the source. You do not assume that any other scholar who's been there before you necessarily has the truth. And so that, that was a major challenge. But I will say perhaps the biggest challenge of all was my ignorance of Mexican-American history. And um, I'm embarrassed now to think of, of precisely how ignorant I was, and I no doubt to some extent remain. But having had a really good education, having been taught, having taught for many, many years, I still didn't know enough about Mexican-American history. And one of the great things about the book was that it made me go back and give myself a crash course in Mexican history, Mexican-American history, so that I do feel a little bit better educated now. So aside from all of the problems, there was also that great reward. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, Claudia Sanchez with National Public Radio. Um, could you or did you examine the role of LULAC in this case, which I believe turned down the men, this family, initially, before Marcus took it up? And what effect did the ruling in the Mendes case have on black children in California? Okay, for those of you who don't know, LULAC is the League of United Latin American Citizens, which is an organization that was put together in Texas in the 1920s, um, a very important organization um, that uh, insisted, among other things, that its members speak English. The, the great emphasis was on American citizens and the idea that Latinos were going to start asserting their rights in an organized fashion um, as, as American citizens. LULAC had many chapters throughout the Southwest by the time the Mendez case was brought, but it did not have any chapter in Orange County. And um, LULAC was not involved in the case at the trial level at all. There's, I repeat a story in the book which I um, got from uh, people who were there at the time, um, back in the 40s, to the effect that a LULAC organizer had come to Orange County thinking about setting up a chapter, had gone into a barber shop because he needed a haircut. Um, identified himself as LULAC, and it turned out that the barber was already a member of one of the Mexican organizations that had been founded locally, and uh, thought, hey, now this is really a good idea, this LULAC that has some kind of national presence, although it was pretty much confined at that point, to the Southwest. 
gathered some of the other people from his organization. They put together a LULAC chapter. And the LULAC chapter then organized three different fundraisers for the appeal in the Mendez case. So they did get in at that point. But I, again, this is something else that is kind of wrong in some of the scholarship, the saying that LULAC was in. And I, I can't verify this, but Sylvia Mendez does say that she can remember her father going to some of the local Mexican-American organizations and asking for their help before the case was brought, and being turned down on what no doubt seemed like the very reasonable grounds that you won't win it because you can't bring a case about racial segregation successfully in this, in this day and age. Um, then as for the effect on, on African-American children, I don't know. This is not something that I've looked into. I can tell you, however, that there were not very large numbers of African-American children in California at that time. But to the extent that there were such um, African-Americans, at least in Orange County, they were sent to the white schools. And it was really interesting to me to see that at the moment when the South was carefully segregating African Americans from white kids, in California, they, the African Americans were being segregated um, from Latino kids. And the idea, at least what we got from the, uh, some of the people involved in, in the Mendez case, some of the school officials, was that African American kids would feel uncomfortable as a very small minority in the white, in, in the Lat Latino schools, and so they would be sent off to the white schools. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, and certainly indicates how ap artificial all of this race stuff is, is throughout American history. I'm John Britton, a law professor at the University of District of Columbia and a former chief counsel for the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. I'd like to ask all of you, or any one of you, why you think Mendez and Hernandez are so underrepresented in history. Mendez was for Chicanos in California what Brown was for African Americans. And Hernandez decided about two weeks before Brown was also to uh, Latinos what Brown was, as Tom pointed out, in giving them equal rights under the 14th Amendment as a group apart. When we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Brown uh, several years ago, there was little mention of uh, Hernandez. Why do you think that's so? Is it, by the way, because Spanish culture is ethnic and African American is race and there was never any segre never any slavery against Latinos? I'm going to, I don't know actually, but, but my guess is that for the longest time and today, Mexican Americans were not seem, seen as victims of discrimination in the wider space. And um, because they, there was question about whether they were a separate race or not, even within the culture itself. And so I think that sort of lack of specificity about whether this was really about civil rights and whether there was really racism um, against Hispanics um, contributed to it being sort of not looked at as an example of um, a case about race and a case about civil rights, unfortunately. Tom, do you want to? I, you know, I think that the issue of intraracial, uh, as Delia has described, may be a part of the explanation. I think it probably clearly is a part of the explanation. Um, but I think there's been inadequate exploration of why that developed the way that it did. Because of course, as we all know, notions of race uh, really are quite fluid throughout the history uh, of this country. Um, and it's even true today, if you look at a census form at Malda, where we do a fair amount of census outreach, we get a number of questions about why in the Latino community, why are there two questions? Why is there first a question about whether I'm Hispanic, Latino, and then a second question about race? And by the way, what does that mean I'm supposed to put with respect to the second question um, about race? And there's a whole historical reason for the development. And Dr. Strum goes through a little bit of that uh, in, the, in the 1930 census and following. Um, so I think that's a piece of it. But I also think that, by and large, in this country, discussion about civil rights issues 
has always been uh, bilateral. It's black, white. And I don't know whether that's because it's, well, I think a part of that is because it's easier to talk about an issue as involving only two sides. Um, when you have to recognize uh, that there are multiple sides, uh, it becomes more, more complicated to discuss and to frame policy around. Um, but I also think, third, you, we have to acknowledge that the African American community has uh, been much more well organized um, about raising issues from their history and ensuring that, that they're highlighted. Um, and, and I think part of that has to do with their being better organized and therefore in the lead in the civil rights struggle, appropriately given the experience of slavery. Um, but I think that the Latino community has a great amount to do at this point in time uh, to make sure that, uh, that we are filling out the picture, as it were. You know, Latinos for almost a decade have been the largest minority group in the country for the first time. And the Latino community is now no longer a regional community. When Mendez was going on, one could fairly have said that the Latino community in this country was really only in the southwestern states, most of which used to be a part of Mexico, and pockets in Chicago, New York, and Florida. So very much a regional group. It's now clearly true that the Latino community is a national minority group with significant representation in every region and every state of the country. Uh, with that comes responsibility. Um, and with that comes, I hope, a greater role in trying to address the phenomenon that, that you've accurately described. And I think Dr. Strum's book is an important part of beginning to do that. Hi, my name is Carmen Orozco Acosta. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Notre Dame, and I study black and Latino politics. So my question to you starts with how I first heard of the case, which was early in grad school for me. And it was actually presented to me in a very negative way by one of my professors because they didn't choose to say they were different from white, that they were I didn't emphasize ethnicity since we're not considered a race. And so I'd always internalize it as sort of a negative thing. So I was surprised that didn't come, that side of it didn't come up in the panel. It was, I think you said it was excellent or surprising or something, but not negative. So I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit more about why at that time they couldn't fight Plessy more directly and why they couldn't say we're not white but separate is unequal. And if they had fought it that way, how would it have affected Brown? You know, I, I think this is one of the most fascinating things about the Mendes case. Um, and I think that the, the, the only place that I might have a little bit of a quibble with, with Dr. Strum is how you ended up, Marcus and the plaintiffs ended up making the decision that they did to stipulate that this was intra-racial. I think that much of that story is in the book. Um, and it is about avoiding Plessy. I mean, you can't get around the fact that a district court judge, any district court judge, would be powerless to ignore the Plessy precedent. So they... By they, I mean both the judge and the plaintiffs and their lawyers need to find it, needed to find a way to distinguish it. Um, and at the time, probably one of the uh, clearest ways to avoid it uh, is to claim that it's intraracial and not interracial. In fact, I think in, in some ways the, the more difficult question is why the school district would agree that that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, because you would think from the, the standpoint of legal tactics, it would be in the school district's interests to try to claim that it's completely indistinguishable from Plessy, and therefore they should have been arguing that it was an instance of interracial. And I think it's a fascinating question about why they didn't. It clearly had to do with a lot of denial, and you see that in some of the statements that their experts and their superintendents who put themselves forward as experts um, uh, choose to, to make. Um, but I think the other thing that's worth noting is Dr. Strum put up on, on the screen the law that was in effect in California. And it is true that it did not specify Mexicans or Mexican-Americans. But if you read the way the permitted segregation of Native Americans is described, it basically says you can segregate Indians who are not Indians from the United States. Now, there are some who would interpret that as meaning Mexican Indians. Uh, and in fact, if you go back to the history of the United States-Mexico War, 
a lot of the discussion about justifying taking over Mexico was built around statements by folks like John Calhoun that this was a backward race of people who were overwhelmingly Indian, therefore savage, therefore incapable of governing so large a space. So there is this history in the 19th century nationwide of demonizing the Mexican nation by using anti-Indian stereotypes and epithets. So you can see how that might have led into the way that particular law was described. And I think one of the most fascinating things in Dr. Strum's book is there is testimony, I think it was at some point, um, that if one of the testifying parents, she was told by someone in one of the school districts that if she had classified her children as Spanish, it would be perfectly fine for them to attend the white school. Uh, but because they were classified as Mexican, they couldn't, um, which is interesting given the justification based on language. Um, <laughs> but really, if you read between the lines there, a lot of that has to do with race. And remember that in the first uh, paragraphs that Dr. Strum read, um, the Virauri children were lighter skinned uh, and therefore allowed to, uh, as well as their last name being non, not a Spanish surname, were allowed to go to the other school. Um, so I, I think that this is a, a, a fascinating set of issues, but you can also imagine, my point is, that if you were trying to avoid any potential application of that California statute, uh, you would want to claim that this is intraracial as well. And interestingly enough, when the Ninth Circuit gets the case, there are two distinctions um, of what was going on in the South are, number one, this is intraracial, and number two, there's no state statute, unlike in the South that mandates the segregation that's going on here. And Dr. Strum goes over how you know, that's an interesting from a legal standpoint as well because you could have decided this case entirely based on a violation of state law or you could decide it based on a violation of equal protection and federal constitutional protection. I wonder, I mean, do you have a, an answer as to why the school district went along quite determinedly with the strategy of avoiding characterizing the segregation as race-based. There's a passage on page 88 and 89 where the, um, the school district official is testifying and he says, the question, is it not a fact that you believe that the Mexican is not of the white race? I believe he's an American. I don't believe he is of the white race, no. And then there's a short break. And then Marcus pursues the race question and the witness turns around and says, uh, actually, I think that uh, that they are of the Caucasian race. I was merely talking as to color when I said white. And so, you know, I mean, you get into these, the kind of insane hair splitting that, that is permeating our, that permeates our racial history. But, I mean, I wonder if this relates to the last question about the bipolar quality of our racial history, that it's black versus white. And in fact, not only potentially, and I don't, I don't know this, but the ambivalence of um, Hispanics and Latinos with claiming race-based rights. So part of why this, this case is not more known and Hernandez might not be more known is a sense of, do I want to throw my lot in as a minority or as an ethnic group that needs these rights? Um, and, and I wonder whether what the school district is up to here is like if they call these folks in, in effect, black, well, that really would seem like bigotry. And <laughs> I'm, I don't know if, if that's what's going on. Well, I don't know for sure either, but I think that might be part of it. You know, we don't, we don't want to be bigots. But also remember that in, uh, at the time of the 1930 census, the Census Bureau had decided to say that Latinos were not white. And there was a huge outcry from the Latino communities in the United States and from Mexico. And um, the uh, administration in Washington was so concerned about international relations that they said, no, 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 we can't do this. And in, in the 1940 census, Mexicans were classified as white. So the school district may have had that in mind. Um, I, I don't really know, but, but I'm hypothesizing that that was probably, <coughs> probably their think part of their thinking. Well, and the only thing that I would add to that is that there's also this flavor of 
and I'm not suggesting that they were aware of what the Texas prosecutors were doing at the same time, but the school district does make this sort of similar argument that I've never really understood and been able to wrap my head around, which is that um, if interracial segregation is permitted, then obviously intraracial segregation is permitted. I mean, it's sort of this, uh, they had some idea that they were going to be able to make this claim that if Plessy versus Ferguson allows segregation between the races, then it has to allow segregation within the races, which, uh, you know, again, I've never been able to understand what that logic is, but they made that argument. So I, I, I think it, it's a, an eternal mystery why the school districts ended up where they did on the race question. So. Well, for me, understanding the school districts altogether was a problem. I mean, <laughs> I can't wrap my head around the things that some of those people were saying. I, I find it really hard to understand how rational human beings could say what they said. So I try in the book to just let them speak without you know, condemning and just because I think what they had to say is part of the story. It represents an important feeling you know, among people at the time, but it's a little bit hard to work up sympathy for what they had to say. Uh, yeah, Cha Chen, freelance correspondent. You all give a wonderful speech. I have one question and comment. Uh, I have examined the uh, uh, American school for more than 15 years. And Delia, you talk about the achievement gap. I think achievement gap is uh, due to those uh, factors. First is this, our society is social economic segregate. And, and then the teacher preparation is not good. Uh, uh, and uh, the, there are no uh, teaching, uh, teaching standards. Uh, like this, uh, look, uh, Mon Montgomery County School, very good. And they, they get the, all the best teacher there. So I think that the uh, uh, achievement gap is uh, due to that. And also you talk about the uh, intra-racial discrimination, and that's too. Like uh, if you're in a white uh, city, and there's uh, some difference o over there. Uh, Why don't you get to your question? We'll give it the, the, them an opportunity to respond, okay? Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is this. When, when you talk about this uh, Mandela case, I, I'm thinking that the why 14 years later, uh, then there's a Brown case. My own explanation is that in the Mandela case, they probably only uh, in, implement in California state particularly the Southern California, and uh, then they are only for Latin American. And in the Brown case, and that's uh, only for the uh, African American. That's only I can get explained. Uh, I, 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 I solicit uh, some explanation from yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mendez, um, of course, didn't involve as, as we talked about, didn't involve inter-race discrimination at all. But also, Mendez did not go to the Supreme Court. Um, the Mendez case ended at the Ninth Circuit um, Court of Appeals because the school districts chose not to appeal further. And they chose not to appeal further, probably because they knew they wouldn't get anywhere, but also because by that time, California had changed the segregation law altogether. And uh, it was clear that the tenor of the times was running against them. And I think going back to one of the earlier questions, why is Mendez not better known? I agree absolutely with what the commentators said about the reason, but yet another reason may well be that it didn't get to the Supreme Court and therefore it didn't it doesn't come into the purview of scholars of constitutional law who until very recently anyway have been totally fixated on the Supreme Court and have ignored the lower courts. And so if the case doesn't get to the Supreme Court, She's it kind right of doesn't about that. exist. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've been really treated to a marvelous presentation by Philip Ostrom and excellent commentaries. Please join me in thanking our speakers for an excellent presentation. There is a... Books are available for purchase and, 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 and signing by the author as well as a reception uh, just adjacent to this room. Thank you very much.